time obviously at the um, gallery as well. Now the gallery session, um, I'll speak with you a little bit more about that in a couple of weeks but hopefully everybody will attend. I know that there's not, there's supposed to be 56 people in this course and there's obviously not 56 people in this next year so uh, we'll just have to hope that everybody decides to uh, go. Okay, so there's this QR code that tells you about way three, but you've already seen that, so that's okay. I'm going to do pop quiz. Um, so why am I talking to you about development? So you've read this and you can read this. What's the most important thing on this slide, do you think? What, from your reading of the, of the notes, why do I care? Why should you, as user experience professionals, care about this? Care about development? Anyone? Yes. Is the underlying um, software techniques will drive the user experience? So the underlying software engineering techniques will drive, will drive the user experience. That's very good. That's true. Any more? Yes. Yeah, that's the same thing. We're a part of it. But because we're a part of it. Yes, we're a part of it. That's true. That's good. Yeah. Any more? Yes. It needs to be involved in the development process rather than just. Yes, we need to be involved in the development process <coughs> as opposed to just this separate bolt on which can often occur. One of the most important part of things is this, is that creative software engineers create um, beautiful code, but they also create good user experience because they've got <coughs> creative ideas for how the background processing should go. We're able to abstract away from that, from maybe, maybe they're not so worried about the interface directly, but they can certainly do a better job of abstracting or removing a lot of the complications of bad software and remove those complications into good software such that the user doesn't have to even experience um, such a complicated interactive scenario. Okay, so that's one of the major reasons why you need the software engineers on your side and two, you need good software engineers. And if you're the software engineer, you need to be good. Okay, you need to be writing good code. So who believes me that the code is beautiful or can be or a bag of spanners? That's a technical term, bag of spanners. What you should do, and if, I, and if you don't believe me, all those people who don't believe me should be reading this book called Beautiful Code. Mm. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that you need to be reading if you don't know what I'm saying. Okay, so code has lots of beauty inherent in it, and it's obvious to see, okay, specifically for, good, for people who can already code well. That's why often open source stuff runs very well because it's got a lot of peer review in it, and that peer review. Um, Encourages people to make their code beautiful. Okay? I'm not going to skip over this. This is just a, a kind of a very simple book from a guy called Stephen Whitaker, who's uh, quite a famous guy in uh, uh, human computer interaction user experience. But we're going to get rid of, we're going to skip over that. I'm expecting you've already read that. Um, methodologies I expect you already know. So, who knows anything about cowboy coding? Oh, okay, yes, that's what we like. So, two, yeah, cowboy coders. Okay, so, the thing about cowboy coding is that it's good for user experience, it's good for lots of stuff. It's good for user experience when you have no idea what it is you're going to be developing. When you've got no time span, when you really don't know, when you can have a really good creative experience. And that's why it's often used at these things called skunk works. 
R&D or skunk works, do you know what skunk works are? Yeah? No? Yes? Okay, I'll say yes, unless somebody wants to tell me differently. So if you're going to be sort of where there's no fixed plan, where, that, where really you're just trying to get ideas about what could be developed, what, sh what the user experience should be, what kind of things people should be uh, interacting with, then um, this is the kind of work, this is a, this is a good way to work. Um, it's not good for everything though, obviously. So who knows, who said of Pioneer Studios? So Pioneer Studios was Microsoft's um, Skunk Works, okay, way out of Seattle, um, nowhere near their main campus, Microsoft's main campus, and it was where you got the Xbox from, the Xbox was created, um, all, the, all the primary stuff was created there at, um, uh, at their uh, Pioneer Studios, which was, uh, which was a Skunk Works uh, operation. So was one of their um, tablets called Courier. So have you heard of the Courier tablet? Okay, so you probably haven't heard of it because it was canned by Microsoft uh, higher ops. But the point is that that was just a, 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 a way of them to understand what, what could be the best interactive um, experience that users could have with a dual screen tablet where you could um, move between screens very easily and you had a very much sort of graphic design feel to it. Okay? But there was no particular um, end point directly when they started this. There was no particular end point with the Xbox when they started it. It was just let's, let's do something that would be interesting and fun. Okay? So those are the good places to work. So Agile is good for user experience when, there's kind of, when you kind of know what you're doing, when there's some definite end, so that you can go through lots and lots of tight iteration cycles. Okay? So these aren't mutually exclusive. I mean, there's obviously some overlap between them. So we all know about Agile, you've all just done... Has everybody done the Agile course this last year, or last semester? No? You've done software engineering though, right? In the second year, yeah? Okay, and that had a lot of Agile in it, did it? Yes? Ish, sort of, kind of, okay. Well, Agile in the notes. Obviously there's these four um, principles for Agile development. Um, now, obviously the Agile, Agile was kind of first um, discussed Back, what, 2002, I think it was, 2001, at um, Snowbird in Utah, where you got a number of uh, sort of uh, software engineering luminaries getting together and writing down what they thought software engineering should be about. And they got very little agreement apart from these four things and the 12 overriding principles that go with them. Okay? So these four things individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Now, this thing here is ripe for user experience, quite obviously, because it's about, it's about people. Straight out, it's about what is the people, what's their expectation. Um, working software, so this is kind of this iterative prototype in which we do in user experience. Okay? Customer collaboration, so this is about collaborative design, participatory design, which we're going to be looking at a little bit later on. So this kind of thing here is better than just contract negotiation, is what they're saying. And respond to change over following a plan. Well, of course, that's great for our kind of work because we need to respond to change a lot. How many companies do you know, do you think, actually do this Agile scenario? Yeah? I'm sure a lot of the claim that they do, but it's uh, Agile is mostly about taking what works and kind of does it very well. You can use a set list of processes and how we go through the software at the end, and that's not really how it works. Yes, okay, that's, that's very good, very good. Any other ideas? Yeah? I mean, a lot of companies will be trying to bring it in. Um, and obviously moving away from old methodology is going to take time, especially if they've got some like evangelists who like refuse to move from their more rigid methodologies. That's so true. I think they at least have at least one team in a big company, yeah. if not more, who are starting to introduce that. Okay, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. Any more ideas, thoughts? Yes? I'd like to stick with the waterfall because it's easier to sort of audit and you can say to hierarchy, Absolutely. this is where we expect to be. That's one of the main things. People like to say we're doing Agile, blah, blah, blah. But who's doing management in here as well? Okay, so those of you who do management in here as well, the problem, with, the problem sometimes managers get into is that they like to see things in a nice audit trail with definite steps and completion points and completion times. And Agile doesn't fit that. It's quite, because it's so flexible, it's very difficult to put it into that kind of box. Okay? So even though it's good for software engineering, the managers who are, who are saying, well, we want this kind of outcomes, we want these kind of contracts, we want these endpoints, so we know it's definitely done, often 
sometimes don't realise, but it isn't definitely done. It's a constant process of iteration. And so the problem that manager, people who do management here, if you can be, or, or any of you who are doing technical management at all, need to realise is that not just now, but in the future, you need to be real like responding to the change which is real in the software engineering process and not fake, which is things that make you feel better about how the software is being developed, but actually doesn't say anything about what software really is being developed. Okay? There's, a, there's a subtle differentiation between those two points. So it's absolutely right. It's, it's about, um, you know, you can't put Agile on a Gantt chart very easily. Okay? It's just one big line, you know, iterative development. Kind of. yeah? So that's the problem. Okay, I'm not going to go through these, but we all know things like model, model view controller, do we? Yeah? Service oriented architectures. Okay? So these things allow us to have this thing called the separation of concerns. Now, separation of concerns is quite large in user experience, not just in development, <coughs> but in all the testing that you're going to do. Who knows anything about um, blind trials? Double blind trials, triple blind trials. So all these trials are to do with the separation of concern. So what they say is, the double blind trial says that me, the person who wants to know the information, can't enact the trial, can't be the experiment, can't ask you the questions, because you will know what I want just by my body language and give it to you. Yeah? Triple blind means that... that the person who's gathering the data can't be the person who wants the data, and it also means that the person who's doing the data analysis also can't be the person who wants the data or knows what the correct answer is, because well, the answer they want is, yeah. And the reason why that is is because we can manipulate the statistical process, we can manipulate the analysis process to kind of come out with the answers we want if we really want them enough, okay? Even if we think we don't. So the idea of these separation of concerns through all of user experience and not just user experience. All, most human factors, so it's the same with clinical trials for drugs, it's the same with stuff for um, psychological trials, okay, all this kind of stuff, you can have this separation of concerns which is really important, and it's important in the software engineering process, and that's why we've got model view control and service um, uh, or, uh, oriented architectures, okay. Okay, I'm not going to bother about, <coughs> about those. Separation types. So these ones are maybe not explicitly covered directly in the, uh, in the notes, certainly the bottom two I don't think are. So we know about remote procedure calls and we know about RESTful interfaces, do we? <coughs> yeah? Okay, so we need to, well, we don't need to, but you ought to be aware of those because certainly web server, we know about WSTL. Yeah? Web services description language, whereby you can give a description in data and it will generate you an interface. Okay? For a web service. Yeah, so that's a real separation because you know, you've got this web service acting something and then you've got um, your requirements going into that. And does anybody know anything about the grid? The grid, grid computing? Anybody? No? Yes, one. Well, yes. Grid computing. Tell me about grid computing. So uh, there are many machines to Okay, so grid computing is many machines to process data, but not, not just that. Grid computing publishes um, a list of functionality that says these are the things I can do, okay? And then it's up to the interface or the interaction that you're having to decide which of the, which, what you need and, what, and how to process it. So there's a massive separation of concern there from the processing to the what's required to getting the data through to that process. You don't care, care where the process is occurring. It can occur somewhere across the world. Why do we care as long as the process occurs? And so that's part of this separation of concerns. Okay, so <clears throat> I would rather develop in open source. Okay, so that's something you should know right now. I'm not very much into this um, uh, cathedral aspect. Okay, so has anybody read this book, Cathedral and Bazaar? Okay, and what did we think of it? Yeah, good. What did what what did what was your view in the end? Um, I like the. Um, uh Well, um, yeah. They're quite pretentious. Um, he seems to place a lot of esteem on the sort of hacker culture and the, uh, the open source culture, I think. I don't know. <laughs> it was 
This is pretentious, but it was valuable at the same time. Pretentious but valuable. They placed a lot of stuff on the hacking culture, in the open source culture. Yeah, well, I mean, I do that. I prefer, I prefer to place a lot of uh, emphasis on that too. But the reason why I, I think this is a great, um, like, this is, these are good lessons, is that with open source, with openness, you get the ability to extend from something that, that and we'll see that's one of our principles of the user experience, is because we want to extend beyond something that we didn't originally intend the, the design to work for. So by having open source, we allow ourselves to have some, to, to, have some <coughs> to see something called emergent behaviour. Okay. So we'll see this as well through user experience, so this concept of emergent behaviour. So the web is emergent because... When it was designed, we didn't expect it to work like it does now. Okay? It's, it's kind of gone off on its own and done its own thing, really, by all of the people trying to do their own thing in it. Okay? Certainly, Tim Berners-Lee didn't expect that to happen. And you'll see that in the model for websites, emergence is now uh, written into the actual um, cycle, because we just can't tell what's going to happen when we put lots of people, uh, when we give lots of people the technology and we'll use it as they kind of like. So, if it was a closed model, then that means that because it doesn't, because that model might not be conforming, or the usage of that model might not be conforming to the expectations of the people who have closed that model, the corporation, then there's a problem with looking for that emergent behaviour because the emergence is not working. Yeah. So that's one thing. That, one thing why it's good for user experience, but it might not be good for everything. But it's good for user experience. Okay, we're not going to have a break, obviously, and we're going to go on to picking computers. Um, so this is something that we should have notes for now, and um, this is a part that we're hoping to get in about half an hour, a bit more. Um, <clears throat> people and computers. This is again a background, if you like, um, lecture. So it's about, so this is more about letting you understand that there's lots and lots of different needs and abilities out there. Okay, and we need to look at those in user experience. So the first thing is, Jeff Baskin, I've mentioned him before, who wants to uh, prove that they were listening last time and, you know, tell me what they knew about him. Nobody wants to tell me, nobody was listening <coughs> at all. Nobody knows. Yes. It was the Apple guy. It was the Apple guy. Good job. Excellent. What's your name? Doug. Doug. Excellent. Excellent. Doug. Right. So, yes, he was the Apple guy. So, Jeff Raskin designed lots and lots of bits of software, bits and bits of hardware, actually. And uh, the most famous of it was uh, the Apple, okay, where we uh, looked at the interface for the Apple. Okay? It wasn't a big, he didn't like that much GUIs in the end because he said that they, moved, they section the locus of attention. There's this idea of attention and where you put the locus of that attention. So, for instance, in, in most um, user tasks in software, in devices, we're looking or we attend, we, we attend to a certain point on the screen or a certain activity, okay, or a certain process. We're, not, we're often not multitasking very, we don't multitask very well, okay, it takes us a bit too long to section out uh, the multitasking, which we do in real life quite well, okay, but not when it comes to technology very easily. Now, we also can see this in that um, uh, basketball playing uh, <coughs> video that, we, that I showed you earlier on in the course, you know the one where it's about attention blindness, where you're focused on one thing, you're so focused on one thing that you just don't see the other stuff around you, and that's all about this locus of attention. We also did some other work, we did some work here actually, which looked at automatic updates on websites. Okay, so you know the JavaScript kind of uh, Ajax updates whereby you do something and little things pop up. Uh, little coloured widgets or little coloured uh, notifications pop up as you're, as you're doing things. And the reality is that unless they're very big and, and unless you've actually initiated them, when you're concentrating on something, you just don't notice that they've even happened. Okay. So we get a massively um, um, uh, statistically, statistically significant score for that. That you know people just don't look at these things unless they're 400 pixels across. Okay. And that, they've automat and, and that they've actually um, ex executed. They're expecting it, if you like. They're expecting what happens. So the locus of attention, which is Jeff Ashley's thing, uh, really, is something that you should consider when you're creating all of your software okay, and all of your hardware. Are there multiple points where you're expecting somebody to divide their attention on screens, on pads, um, on iPhones, those kind of things, 
Because if you are, then you'll need to do you'll need to think about how to notify that person that something's happening because their locus, locus of attention won't really be will be focused on the job at hand, not on stuff that's happening around. Okay? Okay, so the bit on this quote is that, that we're variously skilled. Okay, so humans are variously skilled. We've got lots of different skills. We're a um, heterogeneous society, which is good. Because otherwise, if we were all what if we were all the same, then we'd all be dead by now, I imagine. Okay, because we wouldn't be able to survive very long. Yeah. So the, the great benefit is that it's heterogene heterogeneous. Okay. So that well, that also means that we're very skilled. So technology to see that an image or skill match matches up well with the requirements of the operating technology. So this is what we're trying to do. Your user experience work is all about making sure that the skills of the individual and what they what their skills are and what their um, um, natural abilities are match well to the software, okay, to the devices that you're creating. And that's very difficult because obviously you're creating one device for everybody, not you know, you're not creating four hundred devices for four hundred different groups of people. Yeah? Okay. So there are, two, oh, there are two components to this. Training the human to accommodate the needs of the technology and design the technology to meet the needs of the, of the human. Now, these things will occur, but the better we do the latter, the less we need the former. So if we actually design the technology to meet the needs of the human, the human has to, has to train less. There's always going to be some need for the human to actually train or be trained or to understand the device or to understand the technology, but you need to reduce that massively. Okay? So if you're thinking that you're going to create a software system and stick out a manual, a great big manual, you know, um, there's a, obviously a great a big thing in uh, software engineering is our um, RTM, uh, RTFM, yeah? Do you all know what that means? Yes? No? Read the effing manual. That's the response for most. Uh, okay. Seriously, it's, uh, right. no one reads the manual. Yeah, no one reads the manual. Okay, nobody really does read the manual. But that was the that was the thing that we thought would occur. Okay, that we can you can create a great big manual with everything in it, and then hey, off it goes, and you just uh, you just understand how to drive the software by reading the manual on the device. And we can see that that's now shrunk, shrunk down massively. But still, there's a need for training. That's why there's lots of training courses in computers, okay, in devices and how to use your iPad, and the missing iPad book, I don't know why there would be a missing iPad book, but there is one, mm -hmm. somebody's written involved with things that you wouldn't normally realise. What I'm trying to get across is that you need to think about these. Is it something that you know, that seems obvious to you when you build your software, but isn't obvious to somebody who's not skilled at this software, because they're just buying this as a piece of consumer, uh, a consumer device, say. Okay? Or a, piece of, or a piece of consumer software that they're not interested in, um, you know, reading a manual or, or anything else. They just want it to work, and they want it to work with as little hassle as possible. Yeah. So you've got to think about these things. So if you're creating, this bit is key: training the humans to accommodate the needs of technology and design the technology to meet the needs of the human. So you need to really do a good design to meet the needs of the human. And forget about the training, yeah, because it's never going to happen, really. Yeah. Okay. So there are a number of different, I can't that. There are a number of different ways that we get information in, that we perceive information. Okay. So let's let's just go through and, just, and find out what those ways are. So the first one. What's one of the first ways? What's, what do we think is one of the most primary ways we perceive information? Vision. Yeah. What you can think. Tactile, okay, so visual, tactile, any more? What other ways do we perceive information? Yeah. Auditory, hearing, yeah? Sense. They're all senses. What? T touching or something? Touching, okay, yeah, we've had touching, yeah? Any more? Yes? Smelling. Smelling, good. And what's also linked to smelling? Taste. And do you think there's been interfaces built for all of those sensors? Yes, there's been olfactory interfaces. There's tastes, but there's uh, interfaces for smell, interfaces for taste, interfaces, haptic interfaces for feedback and for touch, 
the gestures. There's uh, obviously uh, <coughs> there's obviously vision you know, feedback for all of those things. Okay. So and input come to that as well as some others. Um, so when you think about your designs and your creations, you can't just think that your the, the work you're going to be doing is always going to be in a nice open um, uh, operating system framework where you're going to be banging out code for Windows or uh, Mac or something else. What happens if you're employed by the bank? Okay, and you need to uh, make sure that pilots have a, a good situation for awareness. What happens if you're employed by who does a lot of work, say American Air Force? Lots of work done in American Air Force on military interfaces. Okay? What happens if you're employed by, you know, um, one of these school works who wants you to think differently about how we can actually make the make interfaces better? Combinatorial input maybe. Okay? Before gestures. People didn't really think much about gestures, gesture interfaces, okay? But now, they, now that's what all, that's all we do. So somebody had to have that thought. Oh, we could use gestures. Now it seems it's simple now. It seems easy now. But that wasn't the convention ten years ago. Why would we be just telling you about vision and sound, and that's it? Because there's nothing much more going on. Yeah. So you need to think differently about the kinds of expectations of input and output that people have and we're going to do we're going to look at that in a bit more detail next week um, but for instance how do you get input if you're say deaf blind how do you make get input from a computer how do you stick output you yeah, know that's a that's something that, you, that that would be difficult to understand maybe but similarly what happens if you were in a fighter aircraft that, uh, with um, lots of smoke in the cockpit you don't have, you know, you, you might be deaf. Sorry, you might be deaf because of the noise. You might be because your your headset's not working properly. You might be blind because there's lots of uh, um, uh, smoke in the, uh, you know, in the cockpit. What do you do? So how can you get input? Yeah, the cockpit could do. Yeah, but that's millions of pounds worth of. Uh, well, how do you know you're about to die? Could be just smoke. You can put it out. You can put it out. Can you just roll down the window? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> roll down the window. You can just park up. <laughs> okay, so you need to stop it. So, so think a bit differently about the kinds of input and the count, kinds of output. So there's over 50 different areas of the brain that's to deal that deals with vision. Okay, so with vision, we've got lots and lots of data input, and we resolve it really well. Okay, obviously, that's one of our key points. That's one of our key features. Obviously, we've got blind spots which are filled in by the eyes because we've obviously got the nerve bundle that goes back, goes out at the back of the retina. So there's no uh, there's no cones, there's no um, um, sensory um, cells at that, where that nerve bundle goes out. Yet we still see. We don't see a big hole. Okay, that's because our brain processes the data and fills it in for us. Okay, so that's a blind spot that we have. Okay, so you can see here that it's an equal, it's an equal um, division between the eyes. Okay, so if you've got, if you've got, if you've got eye, if you've got eyesight um, that allow, if you've got one eyesight, then obviously you're not going to see quite the same. You also aren't going to have depth, depth perception. If you've got some kind of macular degeneration, then you might only have peripheral vision. Okay. Um, or you might have tunnel vision where you can only see a very small spot in front of you. Okay? Now these things, you might think, well, why are you telling me about these things? These things are like for you know, disabled people, whatever. Well, I'm telling you them because these, there's, very, there's lots of similarities between seeing a very small spot of an application or information on the front of a small mobile phone. It's very similar to tunnel vision. It can be. Okay? So that's why that there's applications in mainstream uh, computer science. Okay, mainstream user experience. So that's the first thing. Now what we're looking at now is um, we've got we've got the inputs coming through the eyes here, and the eyes are actually joined right it's directly into the brain through the nerve bundle. So that's why that the updates are very fast. Okay. Normally, updates coming up the spine are actually quite slow. Okay, comparatively speaking. But the closer everything gets to your brain, obviously, 
the better it is, the faster it is. Now, there is, does anybody know actually of, of uh, the brain where the dir most direct connection is to the brain from your senses? No? No? Yeah? Is it your ears? No? No? Smell. Smell. Okay, you've got a direct nerve going straightly from your brain down into your uh, nose. Okay? And that's exactly what smells in the mucus that's in the nose is there to protect specifically that, those nerves. Okay? And to trans transfer the actual data. Okay? Transfer the, the uh, um, molecules, the atoms. Okay? Okay. Let's move on. Hearing. So hearing is quite obvious. Okay, it seems to us that you've got these ears on the side of your uh, each side of your head, and in comes the sound. Okay, and by a, a sequence, of, well actually it's a sequence of very small um, bones, three small bones, the anvil, the, the anvil, the hammer, and the stirrup. Okay, stirrup is the last one. So, um, so the stirrup looks like this. Okay, and then you've got the anvil, which looks kind of like this, but not the anvil, the hammer, and then you've got the anvil as well, which is kind of a bizarre shaped bone. I can't, I can't remember the shape of the anvil. Anyway, it's like a bizarre solid shaped bone that looks a bit like an anvil, obviously. But this thing here, the stirrup, is important because it connects to the cochlea, okay, which is the bit where all the data, where, the, where you're going to sense the data, sense the sound. Now, what do you think? that there are this set of bones doing the connection. Yes? So each individual bone has a different uh, frequency or a different type of sound? No, it's not quite that. It, 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 getting there, but not quite. Any others? Yes? Do they mean um, vibrate with the, with the sound that comes in? Yeah, so they vibrate with the sound that comes in the ear, but what they're to do is to cut out the very high noises and to amplify the very small noises, that's why we've got your hearing range of between 5 and 20 megahertz. Okay, so it's so that you don't <coughs> destroy this bit, the sensitive bit. Okay, that's one of the main reasons why they're there. Now this thing here, the cochlea, is spun up. It's like, um, so cochlea, the cochlea is like this. This is going to look a bit wrong, but then <laughs> Okay. With a stirrup just here, okay. Now this is when it's been pulled out, extended. Normally it's a spiral, okay. But there's no point in saying that. So normally it's a spiral. So this thing here, which is called the basal membrane, is the thing that does the actual. Um, it's got the actual uh, nerve cells connected to it that go to your brain. Okay. And what happens is that all this is filled with fluid, and there's little hairs on this basal membrane, and these hairs, as the sound waves go this way, the hairs. Agitate, okay? And so the basal membrane looks like it has a base and an apex, and the high frequency sounds are detected here. Think of it as an oscilloscope, low frequency sounds at the top. Yes, I think that's the way it passes around, okay? But they, get, they can get detected in parallel, okay? And then the nerve bundles go off, okay, into the brain into the auditory cortex, which is there specifically, different parts of the auditory cortex process different, part, different <coughs> frequencies of sound, okay, so that you can hear in parallel. Now, the thing that's important for you, I'll just rule off this terribly, terribly, what would, what would the school say? Okay, um, so the thing to think about for this is that it's not just about sound going into your, into your ears. When you put your headsets on, does that sound, does the sound coming out sound like, um, I don't know, speakers? Does the sound on your headset sound like freestanding speakers? No. Why not? What's missing? Space, space around, yeah, space around, yeah. Noise. Pardon? Noise. Noise, or the noise, that's true. Reflections. Reflections, yeah. What about for our heads? It's uh, 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 what about for our heads in general? Directionality. Directionality. 
So the, one of the main things that it also misses is that you can see you've got these direct sound paths and indirect sound paths, reflective sound paths, which you don't get on the headset because obviously it's mostly directed right into your ears. The other thing is bone sound. Okay, that's a big component of sound, bone sound. And so that's where the sound waves are hitting your head, okay, creating a vibration, and that adds in to your hearing, which gives you, which is called the bone sound. So therefore, you can actually hear things in different levels of detail. You can do better spatial isolation. Okay, because you're, you're not just picking up from your ears, you're picking up from the bone, the spike vibrations through your bone and through your body, mostly through your head. Okay? But you can feel it through obviously your body. So these are the things to think about, that if you're trying to do something that's really good auditory, by audio, speak headsets, they're going to get you so far, but not that far. You might want to have some other kind of vibration system. Maybe we have a little vibration system that comes out onto the head from the headset. Okay? From, to, to aid better 3D spatialization. Okay? That kind of thing. So these are the kind of things you need to think about. Okay, touch. So we've got touch, and there's also, um, with touch, we've also got other things called haptics, okay, haptic information and feedback. Okay, so we've got, so touch is about actually, obviously, understanding what touch is. Um, here, we can see that obviously you've got a probe going, being stuck in, and you can obviously feel that. So. This is because various nerve fibers, nerve cells are, um, are being deformed. Okay? So the way that this works, at a small level, is that you have a nerve fiber, and in that you have what's called channels. Okay? And on this side, you have fluid. This side you have a different fluid. Okay? So, Normally these might be sodium and potassium channels, okay, you might have. Okay? Um, so you might have a positively charged and a negatively charged fluid. And what happens is when, when you actually touch something, this, this deforms so that at, the, at this point, that might be one of the molecules or atom that needs to go through it. But when it's deformed, it opens up slightly. So you get a lot of these going down into a negatively or positively charged fluid, which is the actual, which is the sensation, which transmits the cell, the, the, um, which transmits the signal, okay? So that's how it works, that when you touch something, what I'm doing when I'm touching my thumb now, is that all I'm doing is deforming this nerve channel, so that more of these um, positive or negatively charged ions can come through, okay? And, that, and then it sends a signal, from my nerve into my spine and up to my brain. Yeah? To say there's been a change. Something's been depressed. Now there's lots of other ways of doing this because you've got um, chemical sensors, okay? So ones whereby you um, have chemicals that want to that are that are differently charged, and only certain types of the chemical can come through into here to give you that response that there's a chemical change. Yeah? But that's generally how it works, it's quite slow. Comparatively speaking, it feels fast, but it's actually quite slow. Okay? So that's why and you've got this, you've got you can see there's different kinds of sensitivity over your skin, and there's different kinds of sensitivity um, for the perception of the touch. So for instance, if you're vibrating fingers on your hand, if you vibrate these two fingers at the same frequency, it feels like it's this finger that's vibrating. Yeah? Just because that's the way the senses work, the perception of this of these work. So what you need to think about is that even though you might have, say, a glove, a touch-sensitive touch glove that might be doing some various kinds of vibration, or maybe, doing, or maybe working as you would expect it to, the combinatorial aspects might not be the case. Okay? You might have to do, modify the um, vibrations, the hertz on the vibrations, or you might have to modify the fingers that, that vibrate, because you'll get a different perception. Yeah? Okay. Um, okay, so smell and taste are very much interlinked, and we do have, as I've said, Stephen Brewster over at um, University of Glasgow did a lot of work. There's a card paper, I think, in 2006 um, on um, smell interfaces because smell is very evocative. Okay, so therefore he had smell interfaces whereby there was a smell associated with a certain kind of interactive activity that you were doing. 
Yeah, and so therefore, even then, just creating the smell allowed you to better execute that task because you could remember it better. Bizarrely. Okay. So yes. How can you create a smell uh, within the system because it's a byproduct of a chemical reaction? That's right. And so what he had was, and you know those. Um, think of those. Oh, the horrible smell things actually. Those terrible um, kind of um, things that you stick into the plug, and then it, uh, you know, has this smell that comes out of it, uh, like you know, blades of the forest or something, you know, uh, tulips or whatever, um, to make it air freshener kind of thing. But it's uh, done by heat. So what he did was he had a very fast heating coil, and he had lots of different of these chemical smells in a long strip. And then whenever there was a certain interaction that he wanted to do, he used to send a charge to the, uh, to the heater. So it would heat, evaporate, you actually sense those molecules, chemically sense those molecules very quickly, and then you go, yes, yeah, so I need to do this next. Yeah, that's how it, that's how it worked. Yeah, I mean, obviously, not cotton, it's a research product, you know, it's one of these schoolwork things. But it's, worth, it's interesting, it's worth thinking about that there are different ways of interacting, the different ways we can take information in. Okay. okay, thinking and learning, this is something we're going to consider in a bit more detail in the in, um, three weeks' time, two weeks' time, so with this one, uh, I'm going to skip over this one. Memory, so you can think of memory in two different ways, you can think of memory as um, short-term and long-term memory, whereby short-term memory um, is a bit like RAM, and long-term memory is a bit like ROM, okay, so that's what we can think of. Or a bit like, not wrong, a bit like um, non volatile storage. Yeah? Okay, so we, we're going to either stick it in memory where, as soon as you stick it in short term memory, where as soon as you think about something else, it goes away again and you can't really remember it that well. Um, or we're going to put it in long term memory where we're going to write it to disk. Okay? Non volatile. Yeah, whereby we can do that again. And what, for us, we may be thinking about is this procedural memory, skills and habits. These are the things that people do when they're doing interface, when they're looking at interaction engineering and interfaces. Okay, they're looking at the skills, the habits they can do, the, the, the actual different jobs that they can pick up. Okay? Not necessarily facts and events, kind of less. Okay? So it's this stuff, it's this non-declarative stuff where we're not remembering facts, we're remembering ways to proceed. Okay? So one thing you will also see, which we may get to now, maybe, maybe later, is that um, when you close your eyes and you visualize something, the area of the brain, so for your visual cortex, lights up even though you're not seeing it anymore. Yeah. You're still using your visual cortex. When you're remembering a sound, listening to a sound, and you're remembering it, it still lights up the auditory cortex, even though we're not listening to anything directly. Okay, so that suggests to us, even though we don't know that much about the brain, uh, that suggests to us that there's some value, certainly from the user experience, in having some kind of way of allowing people to re-visualise before they start a task. Okay? So that if, they can, if you can go through in your head certain tasks, certain interfaces, certain interactions, if, they're easily, if you can easily bring them to mind, then it's more likely that you're able to do a better job because you can actually go through those procedures <coughs> in your head without actually doing them. So therefore, a very complicated interface is very difficult to remember, very difficult to visualise, but a quite simplistic one is a lot easier to visualise. Yeah? And so it gives you this kind of learning where you're not even actually there. It gives you uh, an idea of what you'll be expected to do before you actually get to do the task. Okay? And this is all about this procedural memory, skills and habits. Okay? Now, um, Jeff Raskin talks about intuition, intuitive interface. Have you ever heard of intuitive interfaces? Okay, so there's all this idea about intuitive interfaces, but intuition does it really exist? Jeff Raskin thinks not. He thinks that it's just that we're familiar. It's fami they should be called familiarity interfaces or familiar interactions. They're not intuitive directly. So what you need, to, what you should also think about is when you're building this kind of stuff, certainly for this memory, is it intuitive really? Or is it really just something that's about familiarity with an action, familiarity with something? So you might say that Bing interface, the Bing interface is intuitive because it looks exactly like Google, very similar to Google. Yeah? Yeah? That sounds like a small children video. 
modern smartphones like an iPhone seem to be able to do it very quickly, even if they're not particularly well versed on the PC. Key yeah, apps seem to be able to just pick up the mobile, follow them first or second time, run the game and start playing it without having to be taught how to use the phone. That's right, in some cases that's true, but it's often, if you look at what, they, what they're familiar with themselves anyway, pre that, first of all, kids don't have this idea that they're going to break it, so they just keep messing with it. So, so that's one thing. The second thing is that if they were already familiar with certain types of games or interaction, interactive scenarios, or they've seen the parents do those interactive scenarios, then they can easily transfer those interactive scenarios to the phone itself. So the intuition of it, yes? Maybe it's like the fact that it's kind of intuition is more like something that develops from uh, becoming familiar with something. So because essentially, yeah, like you have to develop this kind of intuition from somewhere. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, it's just, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Could it be that they um, get the intuition from more interactions with the real world, like this is gesture-based uh, interactions with such things? Yes, they could get it from the real world interactions. But what I'm saying is, there's a thing about intuition that people will say. They'll say, you'll hear it, or maybe you already have, that they'll say, oh well, I've designed the interface this way because it's intuitive. It's intuitive, isn't it? Of course it is. But if intuition is a factor based on familiarity, then what might be familiar to one person might not be familiar to another person. And so to say, oh, it's intuitive, well, it might be intuitive to me, but does that mean it's intuitive to you? Or to the users? Yes? Where does a preconception comes in? I think uh, in the... Uh, regards to the example of children, I think they go, move from one thing to another. If one thing is taken away, they literally move to the second thing, the best thing they can find to play. They ha do have a preconception of, I've been told not to do this, I'm not going to do it. They just move from one place to another. Yeah. And same thing for the adults as well. If, if, you, if you really want to use something, regardless how horrible that is, you, you will see something totally different. What does that preconception come in <coughs> as well? Yeah, I mean, pre preconception, Obviously, it comes in because it's kind of like familiarity that you're already familiar with something, you have a preconceived notion of something, and therefore it's a matter of actually enacting those preconceptions. Even if it might be, even if might, you might not be um, aware that you're doing it. You know, this intuition seems to be familiarity, but you're not aware that you're doing it. Kind of, it's the same with the preconception, I'd suggest. Okay. Exploration, we're not going to bother with that, I don't think we need to right now. Um, okay, so this just this is just interesting to see um, implicit and explicit communication. Ex um, so we've got explicit and overt. So we've got closed and open, covert and overt. Okay, um, and this is really just about what kinds of communicative signals that you're giving in your interaction, in your in, in your um, in, the, in your designs. So some of these things will be closed. Will be there will be closed um, um, and obvious. There will be explicit, if you like. So there will be like words saying, um, there, an error has occurred. Okay, that's really, really the case. Okay. But what would you think if the, le the lettering of address, when you've typed in uh, something in the form, changes from blue to red? Do you think there's an error or not? Yeah, because it's gone red. But it's implicit. You know, it's 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 not exactly. It's not there. It's not explicit. It's not for, it's not open for everybody to understand necessarily. Because if they can't see, then they can't see. It's changed to red. It's just the same. Yeah. Okay. And um, not going that. Okay. Input and control. We're just going to finish up with these, and then we can go for a couple more. Uh, so there's different kinds of input that are conventional now. Some kinds of input, the reason why we were always telling you about the previous stuff is because you might, in the future, have some massive idea that allows us to add a line to this. You're all at this university, I'm hoping that one of you, so surely somebody I've taught, is going to you know, have a massive breakthrough, be a you know, Einstein like character, and then we can add another kind of uh, control to the bottom, yeah, of this list. But these are the kind of conventional controls and the conventional ways of getting input and controlling now. So we've got keyboard, obviously, cursive, pointing, force feedback. Um, do we know force feedback? Haptic stuff? Yeah? Haptics? Okay? Speech, touch, and gesture. Okay? There's a, there's a difference between gesture and touch. 
Okay, so you need to make sure you get those correct. There's a difference between the touch interface and the gesture interface. Okay. Now, obviously, some people are calling these new these Apple uh, just, uh, touch touch uh, interfaces um, touch gestures. Okay, but gestures can be very much different. Whereby you're actually manipulating the actual uh, the, the manipulating device. Yes, Malcolm. And then there's sort of uh, implied uh, control, like Google's talking about doing searches for you based on where you are in the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. So okay, specialist stuff, HOM. So the HOM is the head operated mouse. So these, these are whereby you can have uh, accelerometers, etc., on, in, on a, in a helmet, and so you can actually control pointing devices using movement in your head. Blink switches. So if you blink, not because it's an um, autonomic response, but because you actually think about it and blink then it's much slower and it's easily detectable. Okay, so blink is another way of control thing. Stuff. Gaze and eye tracking, that's another way that we can actually uh, uh, point. Perhaps the interfaces, immersive VR and sort of, well, pressure switches. Okay, now we've also got new stuff such as um, stuff we control with alpha waves, uh, normally for our brain. Okay. So brain interfaces for people with, say, locked in syndrome. Okay. Those kinds of things. Um, pop quiz. We're not going to be doing it. Luckily, because we're going straight to the next. Uh, yeah, obviously, I'm expecting to read by next week up to page 90. But we're going to add to that in the next lunch. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, okay, so... Um, <laughs> We're going to have a 10 minute break, well, just under 10 minutes. Um, can we go back here for 12? Okay, we've got more and more to do. We're we'll moving on to this one. Hat racks for understanding, which is all about uh, the right status.